Well, I invite you to take uh, your copy of God's Word, uh, which I certainly uh, encourage you to bring with you each Sunday, and uh, turn to the book of Hosea. Hosea uh, chapter 6 is where we have come in our series, Forever Faithful, as we have been uh, thinking on the faithfulness of God uh, being a main theme in the book of Hosea. And uh, it's not only a, a word that Hosea wrote for the people of Israel, but it is a living and active word for us today. And so Hosea chapter 6 Uh, is where we are. Kiddos, if you have that ESV Big Picture Bible, it's page 962. 962. You'll find where we're at, Hosea chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. You know, it's really interesting how difficult it can be to have a correct perception of yourself and have a correct perception of others. Uh, I have a dog named Honey Bun who, if you know me and Honey Bun, you know that I love Honey Bun a lot. And if you were to ask me about Honey Bun, I would tell you how, what a good dog she is. She's just a really good dog, and I love Honey Bun. And it's really interesting that I would say that uh, because Honey Bun is not necessarily trained in any way. Uh, She has regularly ruined rugs in our house by doing things she should have only done outside. Uh, She jumps up on all the furniture. She gets right up in people's faces and will lick them in the face if they let her. She, She begs and whines for people food. She barks like a maniac if someone comes to the door or is out in the yard. So how can I call her a good dog in the midst of all that? Well, I call her a good dog because of my own expectations, right? I, I, I don't expect to have a dog that never makes a mess in the house or never jumps on the furniture or never begs for people food. All I expect of my dog is for them to be cute and for them to be friendly. And she pulls those two things off brilliantly, so it's very easy for me to call her a good dog. But if we're honest, it gets a lot more complicated when it comes to people, though, right? Right? Although some people try to describe someone as a good person, sometimes they have no evidence to show for it. I I sadly did a funeral one time for a guy who had abandoned his family and had ruined his life with drugs and alcohol and he had stolen from and hurt a lot of people along the way. And it was so sad to me that one of his family members just coming up and telling me, you know, he was a really good person. He was a really good person. You see, we don't get to choose the expectations for what makes a good person like like I do with my dog. God created us. God created us in his image and for his glory. And God sets the standard of goodness. I say this because as we dive back into the book of Hosea today, God through Hosea has been describing different ways that the people have been so unfaithful to him, different ways that we are naturally so unfaithful to him. But it's difficult for us to have the correct perception of ourselves. So I can imagine God's people then, and I can imagine sometimes us today going, asking back to God, but God, how have we been unfaithful? How have we been unfaithful? So the sermon title today is simply a profile of the faithless. A profile of the faithless because what God does in this passage is he lists seven practical ways that his people have been unfaithful. To give them a clearer picture of themselves. And listen, as we walk through these seven ways, I pray that we would all be honest with our own hearts. If we have been faithless toward God's in these, toward God in these ways as well. And I, pray, and I pray that that would allow us to confess and repent of these things and, and turn to God who is always and forever faithful. That we may walk with a deeper faith in him. And I pray that we, we tr- entrust our hearts all the more to a God who is always faithful, even when we are faithless. And so I'm going to read for us the entirety of this passage today. 
Uh, I'm going to read God's word over us, and then we will see the seven ways that God says his people have been faithless. And so Hosea chapter 6, beginning in verse 4, would you follow along with me as I read God's word? What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers tracked with blood. As robbers lie in wait for a man, so the priests band together. They murder on the way to Shechem. They commit villainy. In the house of Israel, I have seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's whoredom is there. Israel is defiled. For you also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed when I restore the fortunes of my people. When I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is revealed, and the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief breaks in and the bandits raid outside, but they do not consider that I remember all their evil. Now their deeds surround them. They are before my face. By their evil they make the king glad, and the princes by their treachery. They are all adulterers. They are like a heated oven whose baker ceases to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. On the day of our king, the prince has become sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand with mockers. For with hearts like an oven, they approach their intrigue. All night, their anger smolders. In the morning, it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven, and they devour their rulers. All their kings have fallen, and none of them calls upon me. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers devour his strength, and he knows it not. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, and he knows it not. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Yet they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Ephraim is like a dove, silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. As they go, I will spread over them my net. I will bring them down like birds of the heavens. I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them. For they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. For grain and wine they gash themselves, and they rebel against me. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, they, yet they devise evil against me. They return, but not upward. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Seven characteristics of the faithless in this passage. Number one, the faithless do not continue in steadfast love. The faithless do not continue in steadfast love. God's heart spills forth in the questions that he asks in verse 4. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. It's my privilege to remind you each week that God's greatest purpose for you and for me is that we know him in faithful, committed, and loving relationship. God's glory was to be reflected in the kind of love that we experienced with him and then our sharing that love and reflecting it to others. But what is left when love is gone? In the morning dew, you can imagine, uh, dried up very quickly in the Middle Eastern sun. 
And in the same way, the people's love for God vanished quickly. And what is there left when you are separated from your very creator and sustainer? Nothing but the coming of judgment. Note that God has been so patient and merciful to warn of judgment coming and to give the people time to repent. Pay particular attention to verse 6. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. I want you to imagine a man who never comes home to see his wife. He stays away constantly, but every day he sends her flowers. Should that wife feel loved with those flowers? I I could imagine her saying, listen, I didn't marry you for flowers. I want you. I want loving and intimate, committed, loving relationship with you. Have you ever considered that this is sometimes the way we can act towards God? Have you ever considered that doing religious things can be motivated by actually wanting to keep God at a distance and not actually desiring to come near to him in a loving relationship? It's kind of like you're saying, well, God, how have I been faithless? I, I, I send flowers. I, I go to church a lot of Sundays. I, I take communion. I, I pray at the dinner table. Maybe you're even well studied and you could win a theological debate or maybe you're adept at serving and all these different kinds of ministries. And if God ever challenges you on a lack of intimacy and relationship, you could say, well, well, look at all these things that I've done. But God is saying, listen, I don't first want your time and your money and your service. I want your heart. I want you. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus points out the church at Ephesus, and this seemed like an amazing church in a lot of ways. He said that they were patiently enduring the evil that was coming against them. They were theologically alert, and they were ready to call out any kind of false teaching, and they were really strong and engaged in the fight for the truth. But Jesus said they needed to repent. Well, how could a church that's so strong in theology and so strong in truth need to repent? He said, because you've abandoned the love that you had at first. Listen, flowers are good, but don't abandon relationship. Standing up for the truth is good and right, but don't lose your first love. The great commission to go and to make disciples is necessary, but don't ever divorce that from the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all that you are and to love others even greater than yourself. Has your love for relationship with the Lord grown cold? Has Christianity become more of a system or a set of beliefs to you than it has a warm and intimate relationship? Have you stayed in the fight while all the while lost the warmth of relationship and the one that you were fighting for? Listen, it's not first and foremost about you making a bunch of sacrifices. God already made the ultimate sacrifice for you in Jesus. He wants your heart. He wants you to know him and he wants you to be known by him. And he wants you to be in awe of this holy God who loves you enough to give you his son, who loves you enough to know all of your sin and all of your faithlessness, yet to still love you perfectly. And listen, you don't have to clean yourself up or or impress God or, or bring any kind of sacrifices to the table in order to have that kind of relationship with God. You simply have to be humble enough to believe that he loves you. Humble enough to confess your sin and, that he, and trust that he sent his son to save you. But the faithless do not continue in steadfast love. Number two, the faithless deal in anger, hatred, and violence. 
I will not go through every detail of chapter 6, verse 8, through chapter 7, verse 7, but the main theme that we see is Hosea describes in these verses that the faithless are like a heated oven. It gives this picture of people breaking off all restraint and civility in order to run full force into their wicked desires. In the book of 2 Kings, right before the ministry of Hosea, the, the king named Pekiah had been assassinated by Pekah, and Pekah assassinated the king, and he took the throne as king. And we read that this kind of anger and hatred and violence characterized the whole cultural climate of the time. They were like a hot oven, angry, ruthless, willing to do whatever it took to get what they desired. No doubt we have experienced in our own culture an uptick of anger and hatred and violence in our own day. A breakdown of civility, a breakdown of being able to act honorably towards those that we disagree with, the inability to make any kind of rational or logical arguments without personally attacking or vilifying opponents. A culture of anger and rage fueled by violent rhetoric that pushes everyone to radical extremes and drowns out any kind of moderate or reconciling voices. It seems in our culture that there is no more place for nuance or for humility. Yet those who have faith and and trust in Jesus act differently. Listen to Paul in 2 Timothy 3, starting in verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will be times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. You see, in this growing climate of anger and hatred and violence, we must remember that faithfulness to God means that we have a love for goodness. We love what is good. We cling to what is good. And we do not give in to hateful anger or violence, even if we feel the cause is just. Listen, the ends never justify the means when it comes to God. If the means are proud and arrogant, abusive and brutal, I promise the result will be too. It is the faithless who abandon Christ's character in a brutal day. It is the faithless who feel that they cannot lose their place or lose their power, so they have to be heartless and slanderous and unappeasable. But the faithful continue to trust that Christ is in control. And there's always a way to walk forward in seeking to reflect God's character of love and of self-control and of resiliency in all things. Point number three, the faithless mix together God and the world. The faithless mix together God and the world. Uh, Chapter 7, verse 8 says, Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Imagine a cake being baked open uh, over an open fire, and but only one side of it's getting the fire. So you have this cake that on one side is burned. And on the other side, it's all mushy and and soggy and undercooked. And he's saying when the faithless toward God try to blend the world in with God, this is what they are like. It's like how Jesus described the church in Laodicea in the book of Revelation. They're neither hot nor cold. They're just lukewarm. You just want to spit it out. It's not good for anyone. This can kind of happen in two uh, different opposite kind of ways today. For one, we can be like the people we just read about. Even if you think your cause is judged, you're willing to break all bounds of Christ's character and law in order to achieve it, mixing a godly cause with worldly methods. 
But another way this looks is when we try to blend in so much with the world that we no longer have any distinctiveness. We're no longer to call, willing to call anything sin. No longer willing to preach about the truth of God's holiness and his righteousness and his justice. No longer willing to hold to God's standards, believing that God's love is some kind of wishy-washy toleration of anything that sinful people desire. Now listen, we've seen and I'm convinced that the differences between followers of Jesus and the culture around us are going to continue to become more and more clear. And we're going to have to be willing, church, to be faithful, even when we are the ones viewed as hateful and outcasts and the ones who are intolerant. We know that's not true. We know that our standing on the truth comes from a heart of love and a desire for others to see and to know the true God, but we are going to have to be willing to be misunderstood. Love always stands with the truth because only a true knowledge of God leads to salvation and eternal life, leads to knowing the love of God. We cannot love others without giving them the truth. We're also going to have to get used to a lot of people and a lot of churches peddling the world, excuse me, peddling the word of God for their own worldly agendas. It can be frustrating to watch other people and other churches who claim the name of Christ use God's name to promote ungodliness. Keeping the parts of God and the Bible that they like and throwing away what they don't. So be careful. Jesus' name and fame is used by people for personal agendas all the time. But the faithful will have nothing to do with it. For it is our very distinctiveness that shows the world the truth of God and his gospel. And it's like what we want to teach our children, right? It's okay to be different. It's okay to be different. God calls us to be different. He sets us apart to be different. And in that, we show off a holy and a loving God. But the faithless, they mix God and the world. Number four, the faithless foolishly cling to pride. The faithless foolishly cling to pride. The next description is of an old and senile man who does not realize that his strength has failed. He still thinks he's mighty and powerful, and he stands in his pride, not realizing that God's strength has left him. It makes me think about uh, Samson in the book of Judges, where, where the Spirit of God had left Samson, and he was no longer strong. You see, the reality of old age and waning strength should be a potent reality, leading us to humility and placing our faith in the Lord. But the faithless act like they're invincible and that nothing could ever overcome them. You see, Israel in the day of Hosea was not the Israel anymore of King David and King Solomon. That, that was the height of their power under King David and King Solomon. But now they had a lot more exposed weaknesses, but they were unwilling to deal with it. They were unwilling to even see it. Pride comes before a fall. And the faithless cling to pride and status and rank even in the midst of weakness. They're unwilling to admit their real need for help and their real need for God. Have you ever known uh, someone who is elderly who, who is so stubborn that they would rather die than, than have, someone else, have someone else's help? Are you and I willing to admit our own weaknesses, our own failures, our great need for God and his grace? Do not cling to pride, but instead return to the Lord. Number five, the faithless never stick with their commitments. The faithless never stick to their commitments. The people are not only like the morning dew or the hot oven, the cake unturned, or the old and senile man clinging to his pride, but they are also like a dove, silly and without sense. Calling to Egypt, going to Assyria, it gives this idea of, oh, we might be in trouble, let's go make an alliance with Egypt. Oh, Assyria might come and attack us, let's, let's appease them, let's go over and let's pay them off. 
It paints the picture of always just uh, doing whatever's expedient in the moment and never turning to God, never asking God's opinion. It paints this picture of living on whims and fancies. Maybe the kind of person that always has a brand new idea for the next big thing, but they never commit to actually pursuing anything. It's the person or even the church that's always blown around by every new trend. It's someone trying anything and everything for a quick fix to to feel satisfied, but it never satisfies. It could be someone who jumps in, in and out of relationships. I remember in college, there was always that one guy who had to be in a relationship. He was like a new girl every week. It's like the, that person who always loses and is losing all their money, but they've just got to bet on that next winner. The faithless never arrive at places of rest because they never seek rest in the right place. Is that you? Are you always chasing after the next fad? Are you always ready to read the next self-help book that's finally going to be the key or the, or the silver bullet? Are you the one that is, has to click on every ad promising you a better life, a better body, a better job, and on and on it goes? Have you tried everything except for humility, repentance, and faith in your creator God who loves you and gave his son for you. Like Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you, O oh God. Is your heart restless as you seek anything and everything to satisfy you? Would you turn to Jesus? Would you return? Would you, would you humble yourself? Would you let him tear you so that he might heal you? Number six, the faithless cry to God over the wrong things. Verse 14 says, they do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. For grain and wine, they gash themselves. They rebel against me. Notice the faithless, they haven't given up prayer altogether. They just cry out to God for all the wrong things. It's like the person who's always crying out in self-pity and bemoaning their lot in life and wanting God to make everything better. In John 6, a lot of people were following Jesus, not because they believed in him, but because they had, he had given them bread. And so they were following him, but Jesus told them, said that they were really missing it because they would not believe that he was the true bread of life. Now, no doubt there are blessings that come with placing our faith in the gospel. But the greatest blessing and the whole point of the gospel is that we get God himself. The gospel is not a message, come to Jesus, and then Jesus will give you all the things that you naturally want. No, the gospel is be saved from these sinful desires. Come to know God himself. Be reconciled to a holy God. But the faithless, they don't really want relationship with God. They only cry out to him when they want something from him. Think about the prodigal son. He had this wonderful, loving father, but he asked his father for, an inherit for his inheritance early, and he left. It was a slap in his face. It's like saying, God, I don't want you. I just want your stuff. This verse goes on to say that for grain and for wine, they gash themselves. It's the idea of praying like a pagan, sacrificing and chanting over and over again and, and even hurting yourself, thinking that you can manipulate and wear God down to finally give you what you want. This is faithless because the truth is that God is a good father who loves you and loves to give, give good gifts to his children. God is in the heavens doing all that he pleases. He has already made the final sacrifice in his son. We do not sacrifice or seek to manipulate God. We cannot somehow uh, grow in faith in a way that will manipulate God to make him do what we want him to do. I confessed to you a few months back in a sermon that my car was breaking down, but I really wanted to make it to the homecoming game, and so I 
I repeated out loud every Bible verse and every spiritual hymn I could think of, believing that God would somehow bless my car and get me all the way there. And that was extremely pagan of me in that moment. And yes, I did make it to the game, but that's not the point. Jesus warned us of this kind of praying in Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. He said, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. So instead, ask in faith. Ask knowing that God is your intimately loving and good father who knows all of your needs. Ask understanding that God knows better than you do. And that he is going to give you the best thing for you in his perfect wisdom, even if you can't see it right now. Timothy Keller, he, he said it this way. If we knew what God knows, we would ask exactly for what he gives. If we knew exactly what God knows, we would ask exactly for what he gives. Ask knowing that the greatest gift has already been given to you, the sacrifice of his son Jesus for your salvation, so you don't have to stop asking. You can ask. But you can trust that no matter what, God's heart for you is good. He's already shown that to you in the cross and resurrection. You can trust in your good father. But the faithless cry out to God over the wrong things. Finally, number seven... The faithless fight for the wrong things. The faithless fight for the wrong things. Verses 15 and 16. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. They return, but not upward. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. We have seen throughout the Old Testament that God has always protected his people when they turned to him for help. He equipped them for battle. He trained them for battle. Yet now it is as if they have turned their weapons against God himself. This is what we are like. We point ourselves in God's direction. We say, God, you're my hope and you're my joy. You're my purpose. You're my security. You are my salvation. And then we go and head toward him. Only as we're walking down that straight and narrow road, only we suddenly veer off course toward another direction. How many times have I done this? How many times have I pointed myself in God's direction and said things like, God, I'm laying this sin and struggle aside and I'm going all in with you and I'm not going to go back to these things in my past and I'm moving forward with you and I set down the straight and narrow path only to be diverted again only to be running once again to the very things that I said that I was leaving behind, only to be doing the very things that I hate when all the while the things that I want to do, I do not do. So what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do with a profile of faithfulness coming from this prophet, uh, excuse me, a profile of faithlessness coming from this prophet when we so easily see ourselves in the descriptions? Well, remember that this profile is connected to the command in chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. It is amazing to think in two chapters where there's this huge profile of all these ways that we are faithless. There's only one command. There's only one. So what do we do about it, God? Do we bring more sacrifices? Do we go to church more? Do we read our Bibles and pray more? What do we need to do? And God says, no, I don't want flowers. I want your heart. Come, let us return to the Lord. For yes, he has torn us. We've been convicted. We've been hurt by this this picture of faithlessness and we see ourselves in it. But he has done it that he might heal us. He has struck us down that he might bind us up. 
These portions of scripture describing our sinfulness in such detail are, are for the purpose of tearing us and striking us down that he might heal us and bind us up. There are a few verses in the passage that point us to God's heart in the midst of our faithlessness. Ones I kind of skipped over as I walked through those seven things, but I now want to come back to. Chapter 6, verse 7. But like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. Can we be honest for a moment? If you're like me, when you think back on the first sin where Adam and Eve ate the fruit... It just doesn't seem that bad. I mean, the Bible says that Adam brought sin into the world and sin brought death to everyone because all men sinned. Ooh, what did he do? He ate a piece of fruit. Really? Him eating that piece of fruit turned into all this? But listen, it's like Hosea has been trying to show us all along. It wasn't about the greatness of the sin itself. It is about the greatness of the one who was sinned against. God, the Holy One, had miraculously created, He had abundantly provided, and He had most importantly uniquely gifted humanity to be in intimate relationship with the God of the universe in His beauty and holiness and perfection, yet we have been faithless. Verse 11 declares that there is a harvest appointed. And when that final harvest comes, all who humbled themselves and placed their faith in Jesus will have their fortunes restored and they will live in right relationship with the God who created and who loved them. Yet all who cling to their pride and all who run after other lovers and and desire what God would give them more than God himself All the faithless who would not trust in him but cling to their pride will finally be thrown into the lake of fire and separated from God forever. And make no mistake, chapter 7, verse 2 says, they do not consider that I remember their evil. Nothing is hidden from God. God knows. You can put on a mask in front of me You can put on a mask in front of your family members and your friends and your church family, but God knows. But listen, in every way that we are faithless, in every way that we have failed, God loves us so much that he sent Jesus who succeeded in being faithful in our place. Jesus was faithful in every way that you and I have been faithless. Then Jesus died, the faithful in the place of the faithless. And then he rose again three days later to defeat the curse of our faithlessness. And though we are unfaithful sinners, we are given the faithfulness of Christ when we turn, when we humble ourselves, when we repent of our sins and trust in him by faith. Consider God's great and gracious and loving heart to warn us and to speak to us so truthfully about ourselves so that we could be convicted by the Holy Spirit so that we could repent and turn to him. Remember the heart of God in Jesus' words in Luke 13, 34, as Jesus looked over Jerusalem and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. It's like that picture that we've thought about every week that's get, that we're given in Hosea 1 through 3 of, of Hosea when he's called to then go and love again a woman who has been unfaithful. It would have been so easy. We would have felt so justified to say, that's it. She doesn't want me. Don't you see? She's been faithless and unfaithful over and over and over again. But we see the resilient heart of God and compassion for us that, oh, if you would just repent. 2 Timothy 2, 13 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. 
If we wanted one verse to kind of give us a summary of all that is in Hosea's heart to show us is that if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So as followers of Jesus, we are called to live by faith. I love that he says we're called to live by faith, not by sight. All that we do is to be done in faith. We learn what that means in the, in the loving and, and raising of our children. We learn what that means in the, in the getting old, growing older and becoming grandparents and elderly and becoming weak. We learn how to do that in faith. We learn how to do our, our jobs and our vocations and, and faith in, with faith in God. We learn how to spend our time and our resources and our service through, through faith in God. And we, we learn even to rest and, and enjoy rest recreation with faith uh, in faith in God for in all things Hebrews eleven six tells us without faith it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him So in all things, do you believe that God exists and he rewards those who seek him? How are you walking by faith in the Son of God today? Are you experiencing God's faithful and steadfast love in relationship with Jesus? Is that leading you to desire to be found faithful in your character? What descriptions of the faithless convict your heart the most today? Would you confess that to God? Have you trusted in God's good and gracious love towards you that he has loved you even while you were faithless and he has given his faithful son to pay the penalty of your faithlessness so that you can freely walk by faith? Listen, if you're here today and you know God is asking you to take a step of faith, whether that's to repent and believe in Jesus for the very first time or whether that's to take a step of faith in in your family life or in your job or in your walk with Jesus. Maybe it's to take the step of faith and be publicly baptized as Jesus asks you to do and you've never done that. Or maybe it's to take a step and to join a local church. Listen, we would love to have that conversation with you. So uh, Pastor Mike... Avery, one of our pastors, he's going to be right over here. And, and when we finish our last song and we, and we go today and everyone's hanging out and talking, this is always a kind of a clear space over here. I just want to challenge you and encourage you to go over and talk to Mike. He'd love to talk with you more and to pray with you about whatever step of faith God is calling you to this day. Let's pray together. God, when we come to a passage that is difficult, not not difficult to understand, but it's difficult in the terms of its content, that's, that's profiling our sin and faithlessness. Lord, I pray that still then you would give us ears to hear what the Lord has to say to his church. I pray that we would see that that front half of the gospel, the the hurtful part, the part that tears us and and pulls us down, that that is God's loving grace in telling us the truth about ourselves and our own hearts so that we might see the sacrifice of Jesus as all the more glorious and that we might trust in what you've done on our behalf. Lord, I pray for us all here in these next few moments as we consider what you have said and as we sing, Lord, I pray that you would help us examine our own hearts. Are we ones whose whose love so quickly fades away? or Are we ones that are so easily deal in anger and and fear and violence, Lord God, in in terms of our attitudes and, and the ways we go about things in our lives, Lord? Are we Are we giving in to the culture around us that's pushing us towards such extremes, Lord God? Or are we like that bird, that dove that 
never commits to anything. We flit around and we try to find satisfaction in all these ways and it's always a new idea and a new relationship and this is going to be it and this is going to be that and we clickbait everything online thinking, yeah, this is finally going to solve it and, and we're miserable. Or are we like that senile old man who does not see our vulnerabilities and our weaknesses and so we believe that we're good on our own. Are we ones who, who just pray and sacrifice and think we can somehow twist your arm and manipulate you to giving you what, you, what we want? Or are we ones who, who give ourselves in relationship with you and enjoy relationship with our good Father? Lord, we confess, we know we're all ones who are like that arrow that, yes, we shoot straight, we want to walk the straight and narrow, but so oftentimes we're diverted from the path. So we thank you for the gift of repentance and faith. And we trust in you always. And we go from here in, sure, in full assurance of faith that you exist and you reward those who seek you. So may we seek you this day. In Jesus' name I pray.